Well, hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, on behalf of the Jewish Education Project and the Digital J Learning Network, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the next installment in our ongoing series of professional learning sessions. For any of us using blended learning uh, to personalize the learning experience for our students, we often need to re-examine how we make the most use of uh, class time, regardless of which blended models we might be choosing. Um, you know, rather than just filling in extra time with some worksheets that we try to convince ourselves are providing enrichment, a lot of educators who are using blended learning models have been starting to incorporate di different types of project-based learning to help provide a richer learning experience for their students. So as we think about these different resources, it's important for both teachers and students to understand how these different tools work and how to best use them in our learning. So today we're going to look at Makerspace, a type of project-based learning that helps students make their own learning meaningful while they hone those all-important problem-solving and critical reasoning skills. Now the shift toward more student-driven, student-centered learning is happening now, and there's no better time than now to learn more about it. And we're very pleased to have with us today Tick Wiener, who is the Chief Academic Officer at Mag and David Yeshiva High School in Brooklyn. She's also the co-founder of Idea Schools Network for PBL, through which she's earned a Joshua Ventures Fellowship. Tikva has been at the forefront of bringing project-based learning, or as she likes to call it, passion-based learning, to the field of Jewish day school education. We're delighted to have Tikva here to help us learn more about Makerspace and how it can help to deepen student learning and engagement. But before I turn it over to Tikva, there's one quick, quick bit of housekeeping I just want to address. During the session, you may find you have questions. Things come up, and you may, you may want to make a comment or ask a question. Um, while we don't have an actual interactive chat available, there is a Q&A feature. So if you look to the right of your screen, I believe in the upper right, if you mouse over, you'll see an, an icon with the, with the label Q&A. If you click that, you'll have the ability to ask questions during the presentation. Now, this is not chat, but we will be monitoring the questions and we will do our best to bring them into the discussion. So at this point, I will turn it over to Tikva Wiener, and Tikva, it's all yours. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Gary. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, so today we're talking about the maker movement in Jewish education, which is actually a really favorite topic of mine. And I want to start off by explaining a little bit how I became interested in the maker movement. Um, it's a little bit counterintuitive because I really, my roots are as an English teacher. So how does an English teacher end up interested in things that may, maybe um, an engineering or another staff teacher um, should be interested in? Um, and I kind of, when I was preparing for, the, for today, I was kind of thinking about these kind of old roots of where my making, you know, where I was a maker. And, um, and I started thinking about a... Um, an exercise that I did with um, the instructors from High Tech High. They came to Mag and David um, for a professional development day in June. Um, High Tech High is a project-based learning network of schools in San Diego, California, um, which I will actually be visiting with a group of Jewish educators next week on the 25th. And um, Azul Teronez and Mark Schulman, they are a middle school team of teachers at High Tech High. They came into professional development, and um, they the first thing that they asked us was, "What is a um, the most significant one of the most significant learning experiences of your life?" And we had to, you know, kind of sit at a table and share them share that out with the table. And the the thing that I talked about was. Um, a, a, a production of Root and Astaire that um, my best friend Joni Hofstadter at the time and I per, um, did created for our for by, like um, really for our grade for our with our with our fellow classmates for the school um, and um, and it was all about really making and we did everything from writing the screenplay and producing and directing the shows to set design and costume design which is more the makerish feel and that 
th that experience of where where I was where, where Joni and I were able to kind of bring together our sort of creative spirit um, and kind of use materials that we wanted to use um, in the creation of the show was really powerful. And so I, when I was doing, you know, fast forward, let's say, you know, 30 years or so, and um, here I am at Frisch. Um, doing an inquiry-based learning program that I started there called Real School, and it was basically kind of the same idea: creating fashion shows and you may Yoon with art exhibits. And we, the students and I, would work, and whatever material came to hand is the material that we decided we wanted to use. And there wasn't; um, it was very spontaneous, and it rose organically um, out of. The things that we wanted to produce, whether it was a fashion show with, you know, with a um, a fashion show with a with a theme of the natural world, or a fashion show with a theme of fair trade, um, whatever we needed to create the experience of that show was what we used. Um, and and to me, that really captures the sort of um, spontaneous feel of the maker movement, the do-it-yourself. Um, aspect of the maker movement and um, and the creativity um, where making doesn't need to be defined by one thing um, so if we if we think about um, what making is um, we think about um, why in particular it's important now um, I think we want to ask you know why why should we make and what should we make um, and I don't think there is a set answer to those questions, um, and that to me is the beauty of the maker movement. Um, that it can, that is so, it's so free floating. It, it so, it so rises from um, the kind of learning experience that each person wants to have. Um, there's something very democratic about it, um, and everyone is a creator. Um, which are some of the principles of the MIT Media Lab, the kind of maybe ultimate um, maker space. Um, why do we need to make? Um, Tony Wagner is um, one of my uh, gurus, and um, he writes in Creating Innovators, which I highly recommend, um, that to succeed in the 20th century economy, that students have to learn differently. They have to be problem solvers, they have to collaborate, they have to persevere, they have Risks they have to learn from failure. Um, there's if you if you notice the uh, there's the high tech high school that I just mentioned, and here's the institute the D school at Stanford, um, which he also mentions, and of course also the MIT Media Lab, which is another place where making is happening. Um, these places are places where um, the, uh, the the where making is. Um, where making is going on in really um, fun um, and uh, and um, spontaneous ways. Sorry about that. That's the bell at my school. Um, so the, um, the 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 things that are happening in the maker in in the maker movement are, it capture all the skills Mr. and Harris all the. Class, please go to the Mac Lab now, Mr. Harris. I apologize class, please go for to that. The Mac lab now. <laughs> School, so um, so the um, the the maker movement is um, it really captures all the skills that um, we want to see our students have. The idea that you have to um, problem solve, that you have to um, that you have to take risks, that you have to learn from failure. These are all things that um, that are part just are inherently part of the maker movement, which is about making anything from anything technological to anything even craftsy. Um, it's interesting and um, what you see in the maker movement is this wide range of possibilities uh, for making. Um, you see um, you see the Arduino boards, you see Raspberry Pi, you see Makey Makey, um, which was actually made at the MIT Media Lab, but you also see uh, you see wearable technologies. You see 3D printers. Um, so all of these incredibly powerful technological tools. Then you also see yarn and Lego, and you know um, 
uh, other crafts. So you're not bound by one set of tools that you have to miss. Um, so you have this freedom to explore, this freedom to be up to solve the problem in any way that you solve the problem that you give yourself in any way you want, and you keep iterating um, based on um, what you want to create and what you want to um, what you want to do. Uh, um, one of the, um, in fact, here I'm just trying to get to my uh, screen here. Um, but one of the, an article, and I just posted it yesterday um, in um, the Google Hangout as we, as we prepared for today. Um, there's a startup called Quirky, and Quirky is a, um, is a, a uh, it's an it's a it's a startup that allows people to um, invent things and put their inventions in front of uh, a, a kind of group. It's kind of crowdsourcing inventions, and um, the 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 inventions get refined based on um, based on the crowd. Um, so what's interesting is that if we're talking about again um, problem solving, uh, democratic creation. Uh, failing fast to fail forward. Here you have um, you have here you have sorry again. I'll have a headphone. Um, here you have the crowdsource creation process, um, and it's a very a kind of again makerish. Um, ma it's a makerish uh, mode of creating these kind of the fact that we're in this time now where. Maker, making is um, such a common and powerful and ubiquitous experience for everyone is really something that we as educators um, have to take notice of. And, um, and you hear a lot of discussions now going on about um, what making looks like in schools. Um, I've had these discussions with just a ton of people. And there really isn't one right way to do it. Um, there are all sorts of ways that you can bring making um, into your school. Um, you do see um, you do see that it has you know profound effects um, on the learning. Um, it can be really one one of the things that I love about it when we saw when we did um, uh, a teacher at Mag and David. Um, he um, he had his students. Um, he had his students create a uh, a sukkah for um, for Sukkot, and here you see the combination of the kind of making experience with um, real and 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 in particular, you see this boy here painting, um, and there the the pride that the students take in their work and the joy that the students have in their work. So in addition to um, what um, the skills that that people need in order to make, um, and those are the skills that we need in the 21st century world. Tony Wagner also calls for the fact that we need school to be places of play, passion, and purpose. Something I talked about in an Eli talk, where we really want to kind of bring back that joyfulness in learning. We want to kids to feel passionate about their learning. Um, and um, and and making really does that. There's a real, you know, joy that comes from, you know, the making experience um, that uh, you know that really stays with you and goes back to that story um, that I told about my experience in elementary school. Like when I think back to the learning that we were doing and the, the, the creation, there is a sense of like, wow, that was fun. I was engaged, I was being creative, um, and I was enjoying myself. Um, and I think also um, when Tony Wagner talks about play, passion, and purpose, what is nice about that Sukkah project is that you're able to bring those qualities to a very purposeful um, experience, a purposeful learning experience such as understanding the laws of Sukkot. Um, the project itself is to have the boys um, make a kosher and non-kosher version of one of the laws of, of the laws of Sukkot of a, of a Sukkah um, that they were learning about. 
So they had to make a, a kosher sukkah and a non-kosher version of that sukkah. So it's really, really interesting. So here now you have this whole making philosophy um, being applied um, to the you know, to the to a Judaic studies class where we really want to see the kids, you know, kind of actively engaged, obviously, in the learning. Um, one of the um, one of the things also that or one of the important um, aspects of making um, as well is um, here. I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, is is a, or another question that we get about uh, what should making look like, um, and what should it look like in a school, um, and what is a, what's nice about it have to look like anything. Um, it can look any way you want it to. So when we think of school and we think of you know classrooms in neat rows, you know desks in neat rows, and a, you know a particular way that school looks. You know, they're, they're, what's nice about making is that the you know those rules don't apply. It can look like anything. So here are a couple of pictures that um, I went with my colleagues, um, the associate principal at Man David Yeshiva High School, Sabrina Mala, and um, Rabbi Michael Bitone, who is the director of educational technology here. And earlier in the year, we went to we took a road trip to Stanford in the Silicon Valley area, and we went to visit Stanford's D School and Fab Lab. Um, so what's interesting, actually, is that, and here you see pictures of that, um, of actually, in particular, this is the Stanford D School. Um, what's interesting is that the Stanford D School and the D School, and the D school has its own maker space. You can see here that uh, picture um, with, a, with a retro 3D printer. And then it has a separate fab lab, which is basically the same kind of maker space, but it's general for anyone who wants to come in there. And they actually do executive workshops there. Um, the D School actually has a K-12 through laboratory. Um, so what you're seeing here are different pictures um, from the school. You could see here um, there's a prototyping card. And you see here again is what, what I was trying to say before about anything can be involved in making. You know, you see a vase, you see, you know, just different plates. Like when when these school prototyping things and creating things, you know, anything can be involved. Anything can be part of that process. Um, in the uh, in the little maker space with the 3D printer, there are actual you know tools and you know more of the hardware and technology that you associate maybe more traditionally with maker spaces. Um, the, the arrow, which I think is important, it says teach the thinking, teach design thinking, teach making skills, realize potential for social impact, empower kids to make change, and contribute to a larger cause and impact. So those things are really important to me because I think a lot of times when we, when we talk about making or the conversation that we could have when we talk about making is simply well, let's hack a toy. Let's remake what a toy looks like. Um, but why? What are you doing? What's the purpose of your making? And um, why? Uh, why? Uh, why are you making? And what I liked about seeing that at the D school, what I liked about seeing that whiteboard, is noticing that the the making is for larger social change it's to make an impact it's to make kids feel empowered that they can make change in the world um, and that is at the ethos also of the MIT Media Lab the MIT Media Lab's mission is to use technology to better the world so right away um, if you're I think if you're bringing makers spaces into education we should be asking ourselves well what are we making for who are we impacting um, how can this have a larger social impact than simply, you know, my the four walls of my classroom or even the walls of my school? Um, the other thing that we want to um, just to show you also of just the different um, opportunities you, you can have um, to uh, to to create maker spaces in your schools. Um, there's no, you know, again, there's no right or wrong way. Um, what should a maker space look like and be like? I love this one, this idea box, right? Um, you know, imagine just putting kids in something called an idea box. You know, go think. Um, you see kids here surrounded um, with uh, 
you know, with surrounded by with diff, they are uh, um, they have different objects and different tools and Arduino boards in front of them. Um, uh, different types of uh, kids iterating, you know, ki a, a, a student iterating and kind of creates a whole uh, plan. And here's a great student made computer combining, you know, technology with a good old cardboard box. Um, so the, uh, there's no right or way that a makerspace should look. Um, some, some, some st um, schools like to do makerspaces in their libraries. Um, very common. Um, in fact, Mag and David's makerspace is in our library. I think this is a great way to kind of um, revitalize a space that maybe students don't think of as really all that exciting or using it in ways that are very traditional. And here you come and you right away you get them to think differently about you know about making and about a space because you're saying, hey, let's let's hack a library. Let's think about what we could do here. Um, that's really interesting and exciting and innovative. Um, so a lot of schools are doing their maker spaces in a lot in libraries. Um, I've seen that a lot. I've heard about that a lot. Um, some schools are doing maker spaces um, as an after school program. Um, so I'd like as a club. Um, and then it could obviously be anywhere and you can have a classroom, you could have it in your library. Um, the difference between those two options is um, obviously because you know the club is after school so it doesn't, it, not everyone in the school um, has access to it. It's interesting about schools that are doing make spaces in their libraries is a lot of times you know they'll have let's say the maker space is open at a certain, you know, let's say a certain number of hours during the day, um, you have a lot more democratic access to the maker space as a result. It's not, let's say, limited to the kids who are self-selected who are going to sign up, you know, for a club. Those who are already interested maybe in STEM. Um, so, a so having a maker space in a library allows the kids to maybe kids who wouldn't be interested um, in a maker space um, it allows them to maybe be drawn to it. In fact, um, when uh, I've had a lot of discussions about makerspaces this year at Yavna Academy, where my um, where my children um, go to went to school and one goes still goes to school. Um, so the director of educational technology there, Hani Lichtiger, she visited um, the New Milford High School makerspace, which is where that student made computer was, and um, there. Their makerspace uh, librarian, as you could say, um, she tries to draw the kids in by doing a lot of innovative, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, innovative, like uh, um, I guess you could say almost advertising for the makerspace. She'll put on a smart TV, a kind of challenge, you know, that um, that the kids might be drawn to, you know, a cardboard design challenge type thing, maybe like make your own, you know, student computer with cardboard and technology. So she's trying to draw people in um, by kind of advertising the makerspace, which I think is a really, you know, exciting way for kids who are maybe not interested in STEM to be drawn to the space. Um, I think that drawing the non-traditional STEM student into STEM in this way is really powerful. Um, I know that um, one of the challenges that we have, not just in Jewish education, but across the board in, in you know, the country today, is, is uh, how do we get more girls involved in STEM? And, um, uh, and showing them things like interactive wallpapers, um, Barbie doll or not Barbies, but dolls that you can 3D print, charm bracelets that you can make. I know I'm being very stereotypically gendered right now in my objects, but you know, trying to draw draw the girls where they are into STEM is really really interesting. So when you're thinking about maker a maker space, and you're thinking about maybe how to implement that maker space, I think it's important to have the talk about who do we want to um, who, who, who's going to come to our makerspace and who is somebody who we might not have might not um, come have come but we made it so enticing and we, we offered so many options we showed so many possibilities for making that they were that they came in that they were drawn into it um, so the 
the library option we talked about and the after school option we talked about in terms of when you can schedule your makerspace. Um, I know that Rebecca Simon at the Solomon Schechter in Queens um, does a makerspace elective um, with her with the students there. Um, again, that's a self-selected group, so you're going to get highly motivated kids, kids who are interested in STEM in your class. Um, another option that we talked about at Yavne is making a makerspace a kind of like special kind of um, activity that everyone in the school gets. Um, we advocated for that because it, like introducing art or music to everyone and not really knowing where who's going to be interested in it, you know, maybe we should be a, um, introducing the makerspace in exactly the same way. You never know who, who you're going to suddenly interest by offering it, you know. So that is something that, you know, is really, uh, is, is kind of an interesting um, option if we're looking to get into, um, you know, really kind of draw um, as we can into the program. Um, so that's what, those are the different options that we talked about. There's a little sign for the makerspace in the New, um, New Milford High School, um, trying to draw everyone in. Um, design your own 3D printed holiday ornament, which is kind of cool. Um, one thing that I've that um, I've thought about. I'm a uh, I'm very um, interested in um, integrated studies and interdisciplinary studies, hol holistic learning. And so one of the things, one of the challenges I gave myself this year was how to create a fully integrated curriculum where the maker movement is as much a part of um, of the class as any other um, as any other part, and um, and it is actually a a pillar of the learning that we're doing. So um, um, I can share this uh, PowerPoint after, and you can have the link to the curriculum. But what I did was, um, what I did was, I uh, I created a unit for my uh, tenth grade um, that I'm team teaching with a history teacher. Um, and, um, named Joe Naftali, and we are doing a unit called Slavery Then and Now. It's called Flight to Freedom, and we're doing it from now until Pesach, and the idea and the, the question that we're asking ourselves is, um, what does slavery look like in the ancient world? What does it look like today? How might I redesign a workplace to be more fair and ethical, and how can I contribute to the decline of slavery today? And you know, I started off by saying that the maker movement is very democratic and everyone is a creator. And our unit on slavery is trying to show people that when you're a slave and when you are um, bound by the law, bound by really unfair and unethical workplace practices, such as the ones that the history teacher will teach about in the Industrial Revolution, and that the students will investigate through an independent read that they're doing on slavery and through. Um, investigating corporate practices today on fair and ethical treatment of workers and generally different workplace environments, Joe and I thought, what better way to show them um, the joy and freedom of, of, um, of the free person's life than by engaging in making, which as I said in the beginning of the presentation, the beginning of our webinar, is about democratic creation, the idea that everyone is a creator and that you drive your own learning. So here, so we're going to create a, a maker space in an activity for the students within the, is, as one of the activities um, in the project-based learning unit and it will be part of the presentation of learning that the students are doing right before Pesach you know, they're going to be engaged in obviously many activities um, through the PBL unit, but this is but this is one of them. And we thought it tied in real well with the whole, you know, showing the kids that the world was much more bound by slavery, that slavery actually is really a big problem today, and that the entrepreneurial and um, maker feel of our world um, is, you know, really kind of answers that and really empowers people um, to be uh, to be creative and to be the owners of their own learning, which is what we want for our, our kids. Um, so that is another option, and that is something that I'm deeply interested in, and really kind of bringing these different um, 
exciting pedagogies and exciting learning opportunities to our students and just creating these really interesting learning experiences for them. So uh, I've talked a lot. <laughs> um, I uh, I uh, I'm not usually I'm not used to talking so much anymore because I don't love uh, the frontal the frontal classroom. But um, but I hope that I've been, been able to share some of you know some helpful thoughts um, about the maker movement and um, and I hope that um, some some that it's been information has been useful um, and uh, and if, I, if there are any questions that I that people want to submit or have been submitted that I didn't get to I would love to answer them if I can um, and uh, I would love to hear I would love to hear from the audience so uh, Tikva, you you mentioned that um, the um with the maker movement, I'm here. You know, you're talking a lot about a, a separate space. Do you ever see teachers actually incorporating maker space into their own classrooms as opposed to a separate lab type space? Oh my God. Figgy, how, I can't unmute her. You know what? Um, we kind of we, um, we lost some of what you just we said. Lost to, some uh, of what you just repeat? said. To, uh, oh, one more time, I apologize. One more time, I apologize. I, uh, should I repeat myself? Um, yeah, so, please. We didn't get any of yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. Please. We didn't get any of that. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, so when I was um, actually, yeah, when I was um, when I started my you know, when I started Real School, the Increase Based Learning Program, and I got into you know a project based learning. Um, basically, by the by the time I left Frisch, my classroom was Creativity Lab. Um, it had everything from Legos and um, you know Makey Makeys and video equipment to textiles, old books. Um, um, computer parts and the idea was that when when the students and I were creating projects anything that we wanted to create we we kind of appropriated for ourselves um, I would often hang out in the in the in the art room seat in the in the art room with my colleague Ahuva Mantel um, for inspiration um, and now I don't go anywhere without a hot glue gun so um, yeah you you can really create um, a maker space within your classroom, um, which I think is really uh, is really a great thing to do. The truth is that it's really kind of like going back to kindergarten when you know you just had a lot of like students would just have a lot of available materials um, to create with, and you just really want to be the facilitator to give them those materials. And and whether those materials are digital or whether they're you know actual art materials or just interesting design materials you know kind of the sky's the limit and that's fun that you can be inspired by anything oh here's this great wallpaper design or, or here's this old you know model magic box to go do something with it you know it doesn't have to be fancy it's just really what your mind whatever your imagination can create Thank you, Tikva. Um, well, Thank you, know, you Tikva. We, um, we had another you know, question we, we had another from, question uh, the, audience. from uh, the audience. That was what types of things was, what types students of are things making. Students You're are kind of curious what types of things you're seeing students making and kind of what exactly does one do with a Makey Makey? What exactly does one do with a Makey Makey? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so, Makey, I've seen, we actually just had a professional development session where we used it to like code with Scratch. So when you, which is the the junior coding program that MIT, the MIT developed, so Michael Betone actually set up a station where we were um, coding. But Makey Makey is a lot of fun. I haven't found a lot of educational use for it. Um, we used it in a um, PBL unit that I did last year. Um, we just created African bongos because we created like an Africa 
you know, um, African experience. Um, so we, you know, it was fun, but it wasn't, you know, there wasn't like real sound educational, you know, uh, value there. Um, other things, though, when I did um, an inquiry-based learning elective where really it was, you know, what we might call like a, a self-organized learning environment, a soul, um, you know, there I needed a lot of materials in my room because it really depended on what the students wanted to create. So, for example, once a group of students decided they wanted to film a, a comedy show, so they needed video equipment. Whereas another student was writing a cookbook and another student was writing a children's book and needed computers, or and then they might want to illustrate it. Another student was doing to another pair of students was doing an engineering project and they just needed cardboard and you know then they created a circuitry board and a motherboard so you know you just you can you can create um, you you the any the students can create anything that they want to create um, Rebecca Simon has a very set curriculum that she worked with um, with her students um, some of the things they create are like you know um, let's say um, you know, toys with LED lights as eyes, or other, you know, or, or I've seen um, T-shirts with that have wearable technology. You know, they have LED lights embedded on them. Um, so you, you, you know, the the questions that you might ask yourself are: What are the educational value of th of creating things like that? Um, so there, part of it is that the students need to learn the process of using the technology. And then later on, maybe at level two, you're you're thinking about maybe how to incorporate um, the project into you know a really a more serious learning experience. Um, so you can go at it like that. Um, in the in the case of let's say the boys creating the sukha, which is you know working with wood and working with drills and you know then painting and so forth um, and other constructivist activities like that. Um, you know, there the there the curriculum drove what the kids were making. So again, it goes back to, you know, well, what do you want your, how do you want to use your makerspace? And maybe you just want maybe the first thing to do is kind of give the teachers a little bit of a taste of what the makerspace is. We actually just did that at the PD day. Rabbi Beton, you know, set up the um, 3D printer and the makey makey and and we just kind of explored and this way now we can have a conversation in the faculty room about well how do we want to implement this what do we want to do with this um, but you know have fun with it don't you don't have to you don't have to decide this second you know what you're gonna do with it get get to know the materials get to get to feel what making is all about go to some maker fairs um, look online, subscribe to Make Magazine. You know, people are doing anything from making gumball mas machines to printing out 3D hands for people who don't have, you know, 3D prosthetics for, for people who don't have prosthetics. So you get, you know, there's no one thing that you have to make. You know, just if you're, if you're really starting new, just kind of have fun exploring. Great, thank you. And um, you know, can you talk a little bit about um, about how um, making and how this hands-on kind of activity, how it might r really go to um, support the different types of learners that 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 we deal with uh, in our classrooms, the, the diversity that we might see among our learners. Um, yeah, that's a great question, and I, I I'm sorry I didn't even address that primarily. Um, so thank you for whoever you know whoever asked it and Gary for bringing it up. Um, you know I think that we as a you know um, we have a wonderful opportunity here to um, to engage all types of learners. Um, one of the things um, I went to visit the high tech schools at um, at the end of the year last year, and one of the things Mark Schulman told me, and Mark has amazing shopping equipment in his class. He's a math science teacher that I mentioned before from the high tech schools. And one of the things he told me is that when he gets the kids into the more, you know, shop like activities where the kids are wood woodworking, is that suddenly the kid who is fantastic in math is maybe not so good at the wood shop and you know woodworking and the kid who's really not so great at math is suddenly an amazing woodworker so 
um, you don't when you're when you're entering the the world of making, you're entering the world of multiple modalities, whether it's music, art, technology, um, you know, really anything. It's limitless. So you can draw on all the different talents of kids in your class. And finally, your class isn't just about, you know, write down the notes, take you know, take the information down, out, and, and we move on. Suddenly, your class is this lively, lively place where everyone gets to shine in the particular area that they can shine in um, and contribute, you know, the way that they can contribute. And that also, um, the not only um, is that enabled by the, by the making, but also, let's say, by different kind of blended learning platforms where, you know, I know as an English teacher that now I can have, you know, I have a, an online vocabulary program and I know the, and I can assign that and that kids, you know, and the kids have to do a certain number of minutes per week um, online and I don't have to worry about that in my class anymore, right? I can just, I can have the kids do that at home so now class time can be used in this, you know, in this more experiential constructivist way. Um, so yeah, all learners are involved, and the type of learning that can go on in your classroom is can suddenly be very different um, because of all these um, all these technology tools and all the you know all the th all these things that we have available. Great, thank you, Tikva. You know, Great. we have thank a you, lot of people you know, who are um, who are new to the maker movement and are watching this probably to get a little more information and wondering how they're going to incorporate this into their own teaching. When we think about people coming to this new who don't really have a lot of experience, what do you think some of the big challenges that they might face in the beginning are and what do you recommend for them to do to be able to start implementing some maker activities without getting overwhelmed and saying, oh my gosh, I tried something that didn't work so I'm never going back there again, you know, to keep them motivated and to keep them focused and to make it a good experience for them so they can learn and grow with it, at, at, you know, as well as their students. Um, great question, Gary. Um, there, I would, I would answer in two ways. One is, you know, start small and start with something that you feel comfortable with. What do you like to make? Um, what do you want to see in your classroom? Like, take something, take some, you know, uh, take some part of your curriculum and figure, you know, go home and make something at it and bring it to school and and see what the children you know want to do and how they what they what they want to make out of that part of the curriculum um, and you know take take some of the ideas maybe that we talked about today um, in terms of maybe bringing in Legos or cardboard boxes crayons and you know um, just ver keep it simple if you're techie don't keep it simple you know bring in Arduino boards or um, you know LED lights um, or you know uh, uh, you know, garage band or other apps that you want to use in your classroom that you never had a chance to, um, and teach your students, you know, to create a kind of cool song or a kind of um, or a or a you know vi a short video a short that you might want to create that you might want to you know create with them. Um, so you could you could do it that way. Um, Another way um, that another idea that has really just gone so well, no matter who has done it, um, is the cardboard challenge of bringing in a whole bunch of cardboard boxes. And it, this is also great because it's low cost. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't cost you anything. Um, no matter what school that I've spoken to that has done the cardboard challenge, it has gone well. And basically, what you can do is you can tell the kids to design anything. Um, I've also heard, you know, a lot of times asking kids to design a game, you know, particularly in a school where you have older kids designing games maybe for younger kids, like eighth graders designing kids for the lower school. And it's amazing to see the creativity and what comes out of it, especially in this very low-cost, low-risk way. Um, you will be amazed, and it's so much fun. Um, and I would even recommend it, you know, as a kind of a PD, you know, development, you know, icebreaker or activity, it just, I, I really don't know if you can go wrong with it. Um, and I think that those are just good entry points maybe into making, um, that they're small and they're low risk. Um, there are lots of ways that you can, you know, learn about making. You can, um, Dale Doherty, um, and if you contact me afterwards, I'm happy to 
you the the short video he's made about making an education. He's a founder, I think, of Make Magazine, um, and he talks a lot about you know the maker movement and the maker movement in education. Um, so you can familiarize yourself with what he's been saying and his works, and you know subscribe to Make Magazine. Um, they have really they have good ideas. Um, they'll get they'll spark your imagination and they'll spark your own creativity and you'll realize that you don't have to reinvent the wheel um, that there are things that you can do that are very doable um, and there are also um, workshops and um, professionals who are um, working um, who are helping schools implement making into their curriculum um, a good book to get is invent to learn um, and uh, the, right, the authors of the book are available for workshops in schools. Um, so uh, it's, very, it's very easy now to become proficient um, and to get started with making. Um, and don't feel like you have to you know, be 3D printing Barbie dolls tomorrow. That's not how you have to start. <laughs> No, you know, I think that's a really good point. Uh, no, I think that's a really good point. I, I, you know, and just to expand on that, you know, for a lot of teachers, Tikva, I think moving, you know, incorporating models like this, especially if they're very traditional teachers and have been doing the same kinds of things for a long time, it's sometimes the notion of I'm giving up some of this control and, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, it's kind of like a fear, uh, like a place of fear for a lot of teachers. Do you have any just practical advice for people to help, you know, just – in regard to failure and uh, you know um, the first time that they go out and try to uh, approach something like this in terms of just mindset and attitude uh, that might help them to be su uh, a little more successful um, yeah um, we started the year at Meg and David with um, with icebreakers that were all about you know unleashing creativity um, we put we put props and um, and art supplies on the tables. We did this at the Summer Sandbox, which is the educator workshop I run also. Um, you know, so the first thing people did both the Sandbox last year and at Maga David this year was to create, was to make, um, and to, to feel what it's like. And it was in very low-tech ways. We're not talking about, you know, giving people Arduino boards and, and, and trying to get them to involved in circuitry. Um, we're talking about just having fun and you know unleashing that kindergartner in you and um, and it was amazing to me what people created I mean both in both um, activities we get we did give them a prompt and they had to create you know there was it was related to education but it was amazing to me people's creativity and it just goes to show you that it's not all that deep down like you don't really have to work so hard to get it out it's really there um, so it does, you know, it does feel different. Your classroom, you know, the kids are not going to be sitting um, in neat rows. Um, you have to be prepared for that. Um, and you have to really, I would say, enjoy that. You know, that's really the fun of making. Um, if, it, again, if it feels, if that feels really scary, um, you know, keep it limited. You know, say to yourself, well, I'm going to give this, you know, a 40 minute, you know, a 40 minute time slot this week and this is what we're going to do. Uh, whatever the kids get, you know, done in that 40 minutes is great. And if they need to finish at home, they'll finish at home. So make it doable for yourself. Um, you're going. I think you need to give yourself permission to fail. Um, I was Yechiel Hoffman um, just came to visit us here at Mag and David. To he actually kind of project tuned us as you know project based learning um, practitioners. And, you know, he said to us, you know, be forgiving of yourself. You know, project-based learning takes a lot of forgiveness. Um, and I would say that the transition into any new pedagogy, there are so many of these pedagogies, you know, kind of floating around right now. They're, they're interconnected. They, they, you know, the ideas are very similar. The philosophies are similar. It's, you know, a lot about student-directed learning. And um, allow yourself to fail. Um, be forgiving of yourself when you fail. Um, the idea is that you're growing. Um, I would suggest reading Carol Dweck's m book, Mindset. It's fabulous. Um, number one, before anything else that you do, if you're a school interested in change, I would say have your teachers read Mindset or do some sort of activities related to developing a growth mindset. And, and the idea that we need to grow as educators 
that we are learners too. Um, we're part of the learning community with our students. Um, I think that that is really a message that we really have to internalize. Um, for me, it's been really powerful because when I was doing real school and we do project learning with my students now at Mag and David, um, you're right alongside with them as a learner. There are things you don't know also. You don't have all the information anymore. You're not the expert. And that's okay. They might, they might add, my students know more about the, techno, the technological side of making than I do sometimes, you know, um, often, most of the time. Um, it's fine. I don't need to be, the, I don't need to be that expert. I know stuff they don't know. So it's, it becomes more of a partnership of learning. Thank you, Tikva. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can't think of a better thing to kind of wrap things up here with. Um, really that, you know, that whole idea that, um, you know, we, we, it's not something to be afraid of. It's something to, you know, it might be, there, I think anytime we do something new, it can be a little scary. But the idea that it's okay if it doesn't go perfectly. Um, and, I, I, you know, something that as educators, as challenging as that is, I think the, you're right. The more comfortable we get with that, I think we're going to see a lot of great things happening with our students. Um, take the thank you very much for an inspiring and an educational session. I know we all learned a lot today. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who attended live as well, uh, those of you that are watching this recorded. We, um, for those of you live, we will have some of the resources will be posted with the video later. A few people had questions about where to learn more about Adreno boards. We'll make sure to post some, uh, some links for that as well. Um, but for those of you that want to share this uh, session with your colleagues or come back again to it, the recording will be available soon on the, the Digital J Learning YouTube channel. And it will also be linked uh, from our website, uh, digitaljlearning.org. Um, just a couple quick things before we wrap up. I'd like to remind everyone in the New York, New Jersey area, that uh, Digital J Learning is uh, going to be is hosting an, an upcoming in-person meetup event on February 24th, an unconference called Unconference and Unwind here in our offices, uh, starting at 6 p.m. So for more information, please visit our Facebook page or the events page on the digitaljlearning.org website. And also, if any of you are attending the North American Jewish Day School Conference in Philadelphia in March, we would love to see you and uh, would love to talk to you. Please let us know if you're going to be there. We'll be in the digital playground, and uh, we'll also be hosting a personalized learning session. So we would love to talk to anyone in person and learn a little more about what you're doing as well. Um, so th thank you again, Tikva, and thank you, everybody, who was here today. Uh, great session today, and we look forward to more. Thanks so much, and everyone have a great week.